Hello, I'm George Liston CA. Welcome to Dialogue, a program that explores the world of ideas and issues in international affairs, history, and culture. This August, the eyes of the world will be on China like never before in the millennial history of that ancient nation. The Olympic Games will be the immediate attraction, but a deeper question will animate global curiosity. What kind of world role will this emerging superpower play? Much of the answer to that question will rest on Chinese performance in realms beyond the economic and the military. Human rights is a prime and controversial example. The games of the 29th Olympiad will be subject to rigorous scoring. We might do well to consider now the human rights score sheet that China's government must respond to. My guest is T. Kumar, Advocacy Director for Asia and the Pacific for Amnesty International. Kumar, welcome to Dialogue. Thank you very much, George, for inviting us. It's a, it's a pleasure to have you back, I always, and particularly on this topic. And I would like to, uh, in a very clever little way, I think, begin our, our conversation inside China. Mm -hmm. I noticed uh, in reading some papers that last June, a Chinese protest group in Heilongjiang province mounted a protest against the expropriation of public lands mm -hmm. uh, by the government without adequate compensation. And here's their slogan. They said, I quote, we don't want the Olympics, we want human rights. Mm -hmm. So I guess my first question is, because everyone knows about the external pressure on China, yeah. what sense does Amnesty International get of this as an internal concern of the Chinese people from incidents like this? I mean, uh, since uh, China opened up economically mm -hmm. for multinational corporations to go into that country, mm -hmm. You have seen the disparity between haves and have-nots. Uh, it's widening. Mm -hmm. One of the results is, is uh, lands being taken out right. from the people, and people become extremely poor, mm -hmm. and they're moving to cities now. Mm -hmm. We call them floating population. Oh. Around 150 million to 200 million are moving, have already in the cities, and they are pretty much treated like illegal aliens mm. in their own this country. This is in, in, internal migration. Internal migration. Mm -hmm. I mean, they have been treated like illegal aliens. Mm. That means they don't get uh, health care, they don't get uh, education for the kids. Mm -hmm. Housing is a problem. Mm -hmm. So they are kind of stuck in the cities. And uh, one of these um, uh, outcome is the demonstrations. Mm -hmm. Hundreds, if not thousands of demonstrations are taking place now. When these hundreds of thousands of demonstrations take place, uh, and I'm, I know there are a vast number of subjects in a vast number mm -hmm. of places, but is there any kind of typical government response? Is the government responsive at all? Or? Yeah, they are trying to play it both ways. They are mm -hmm. trying to address some issues. Mm -hmm. At the same time, they are cracking down. Mm -hmm. And uh, that's where we come into play. Yeah. Uh, international community, as well as local human rights defenders, try to speak up about addressing the fundamental issue right. of the people that are going through this uh, suffering in this transitional period. You know, it's interesting. You say at times they respond, at times they crack down. That's actually my very next question to you. Mm -hmm. Again, um, I did as much reading as I possibly mm -hmm. could. And Kumar, I ended up very confused. <laughs> because on the one hand, even in recent days in the newspapers, we see incidents like, uh, I'll be very specific, the beating of a prominent uh, Chinese civil rights lawyer, mm -hmm. a man named Zheng Inchong, mm -hmm. who was just brutally beaten in front of his home yeah. by authorities. At the same time, uh, the very next day, actually, the headlines are that China is, uh, says it's anxious to renew its human rights dialogue with mm -hmm. America mm -hmm. and with the world. I mean, those are mixed signals. So what, how do you read this period? I mean, uh, from Amnesty International's perspective, uh, the human rights abuses are not getting better there. Mm -hmm. The whole issue of uh, resumption of human rights dialogue with the United States mm -hmm. is overdue. I mean, uh, they are Chinese are the ones who, who refused to sit with the U.S. Right. a couple of years ago to, to negotiate about human rights improvements in their country as well as in the U.S. It's a dialogue between Why did the, they refuse a couple of years ago? Was I mean, there was, uh, there was little unhappiness about some U.S. Uh, actions. I see. And uh, so they, were, they, were, they used this as a, as a way of uh, leverage. You know, when they want, they will open up. When they want, they will close mm -hmm. it up. Mm -hmm. And uh, this time they are opening up. That shows that they are nervous. Yeah. about their treatment of their own citizens in well, the run-up to the Olympics. Well, that's the point. I mean, you use the word leverage, and I, was, I guess that is the answer almost, that 
is this a period in which the world community has more leverage with China because the Chinese are, as they must be, uh, concerned about their image? Yeah, China wanted this uh, Olympics to be a successful event. They considered this as kind of a coming of age party. Right. To come into the global uh, world affair saying that we are matured, we are opening up. Here we had this successful event. Mm -hmm. They have been preparing this for more than seven, eight years now. Mm -hmm. Interestingly, when China bid for the Olympics, you know, they were competing against Canada at that right. time. They, no one asked them. They themselves linked human rights to Olympics, and they said, if you give us Olympics, there will be meaningful improvement in human rights. You know, I have to, I have to pause on that. I had never heard that before. Yeah. Three officials. The Chinese. Chinese three officials uh, mentioned that. Huh. And International Olympics Committee also endorsed that by saying they'll be watching very carefully right. about the improvements in China for its human rights uh, promotion, so protection issues. That's very significant, I think. This, uh, our conversation and, and so much else in this field is uh, actually uh, based largely on the most recent report of Amnesty International mm -hmm. on uh, concerns about Chinese human rights, and it makes some very specific uh, charges and, and raises some very specific issues. I'd like to go through a few of them with mm -hmm. you, if I might. And the first is the death penalty in China. Mm -hmm. um, and the uh, I guess there, there are several parts to this. Uh, one part might be the death penalty itself and, and the apparently vast range of, of um, uh, crimes it can be uh, administered for. And also the question of data concerning performance on this. What's the level of, uh, what is the precise concern that Amnesty International has about this penalty in China? First of all, 80% um, of world's executions are taking place in China. 80%? 80%. Uh, mm -hmm. the, that's the minimum we have come up with. And uh, most of these people even don't have, uh, get fair trials, if at all, if they get trials. Mm -hmm. And China executes political prisoners. That's in one province called Xinjiang province. We have Uyghur Muslim minorities are there. That's mm -hmm. close to Central Asia. Mm -hmm. They are using this war on terror as an excuse, mm -hmm. and they're executing them. And we have come out publicly and stated that, that China is executing political prisoners. Mm -hmm. So that's one disturbing element. Second is uh, there are also concerns that uh, you know after the executions take place there are there are possibility of harvesting organs without I was going to ask about that, the, the harvesting organs thing, at least as, as an allegation, it's, it's out no, there. No, we, 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 stand, we, we stand by it. It's yeah. only from executed prisoners, by the way. There are allegations about some other issues, mm -hmm. but we know that it's taking place. Mm -hmm. We have even documented that um, doctors wait outside the execution grounds, execution places, mm -hmm. and immediately get these organs. Getting organs is one, but getting organs without uh, adequate consent is another issue. It's kind of gruesome. Quite frankly. It's, it's extremely disturbing. Uh, the only good thing is there is a lot of internal voices coming up, right. protesting right. Uh, about the fairness of not only the organs issue, but fairness of, because like in this country, mm -hmm. the poor and the underprivileged are the ones who pay the price. Exactly. You know, one of the issues that underlies your complaints on the death penalty, I do believe, is the uh, apparent lack of reliable data uh, on Chinese performance and the apparent, or not apparent, but uh, perhaps very obvious lack of transparency in the proceedings that, mm -hmm. that lead people to be condemned. Is that correct? Yeah. Data, we, we are one, Amnesty International have been monitoring it for so long. Mm -hmm. We come up with this figure 80%, right. uh, but uh, sometimes even our researchers feel that it's much uh, higher. Yeah. Just to give a, a very brief sense of context, uh, take us out of China just for a moment, but keep and stay in the region. Mm. Is this question of um, death, the death penalty uh, administered in particularly heinous ways a regional problem as well beyond China? Is it a Southeast Asian issue? Uh, not, really, not really, not really. I mean, death penalties. Yeah, Japan recently executed about three people. Mm -hmm. Three, I mean, but, uh, but the, even one execution is, is, is yeah. too many. Right. Uh, there, so there are problems, but uh, you can't even compare it to what's happening China in stands China. Alone. Yeah, and yeah. also, as I mentioned to you, political prisoners. I mean, that's something that's very disturbing. Well, that's you. the next point, as a matter of fact, I want to bring up with you. Political pr prisoners and uh, detention without trial, I mm -hmm. suppose. Mm -hmm is another amnesty's concerns. 
Do I rightly understand that to mean the existence of what we used to call labor camps? Yeah, yeah. they have a system called re-education through labor, under which what happens is uh, local police officers mm -hmm. and local government officials can just lock people up, up to four years, oh. without charge or trial. Four years? Four years they can have it, have them, mm. without charge or trial. You mean just an officer in some town could local, bring, local bring me in, keep me yeah, there for yeah, four years? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Mm. And um, they are, it's, there is no monitoring. Yeah. You know, the point is even the central government uh -huh. cannot monitor it because the powers have been given to the local officials right. to do whatever they want to do. So they are using it extensively. You know, it's, I mean, this just occurred to me um, that, I mean, that horrifies me, that, mm -hmm. uh, that kind of, I, one relates to that very personally. It makes me wonder, Kumar, to what extent are our own American um, professed uh, uh, failings in this field a problem in, in dialoguing with China? Because when you mentioned the detention without charge, right. I thought of people, what people say about Guantanamo, mm -hmm. or the and some of the and the abuses of Abu Ghraib. Mm -hmm. And we have, certainly have the death penalty in many places in this country. Do the Chinese say, "Who are you to talk to us about this?" Uh, they they always use these tactics, uh, but not in public way. Mm -hmm. Sometimes there is a major difference. I mean, I'm not defending what the United States is doing in Guantanamo and what it did in Abu Ghraib was extremely disturbing. And Amnesty International is having a major campaign on that. Having said that, China is treating their own citizens in this manner. Mm. Uh, you know, it's, that, that's why it's, I mean, they have the power. Mm. They can do it. And also they are using it extremely in an arbitrary manner. Right. And uh, so uh, internally, mm. even death penalty here, of course, it's, it's shocking that the United States is still having death penalty. Mm -hmm. But if you compare the numbers and the way it's happening, mm -hmm. uh, the quickness in which people have been executed, right. it's extremely shocking. I remember one case, and I'm, I'm, it's a little foggy in my mind, but it was a government official, I think it was an agricultural official, and his uh, ministry was found to be underperforming or some scandal, mm -hmm. and he was quickly... Quickly executed. I remember yeah. that case. There are uh, 68 offenses. Mm -hmm. that 68? 68. Uh, offenses that are eligible for death penalty. Right. One of the reasons this might be going on in China, or at least might be exacerbates it all, is the state of the press and what the press can report on. And I think the Amnesty report suggested there's kind of a dual standard that the foreign media operating in China is getting uh, more liberal standards and, and regulations from the government, but that the domestic uh, uh, journalists are getting uh, a tougher time. Is that right? Or is that... Uh, that's right to some extent. Okay. Uh, when the Olympics uh, was given mm -hmm. uh, about a year ago, Chinese came out and uh, and announced that mm -hmm. uh, they will allow foreign media, right. foreign journalists, equal access or free access to whatever they want to report. Mm -hmm. But they did not mention anything about the local journalist. So there is double standard. So only for the international journalist, they, they claim they are allowing, mm -hmm. but recent uh, experience during the last couple of months, that's not so. They are cracking down. Mm. And also, the local journalists are no way even close to reporting. Are the international journalists, at least some of the more prominent ones, making a case for their colleagues, their domestic colleagues? Not really. Right. I mean, that's a that sad would help, part. Though, wouldn't it? That's, that'll help. I mean, uh, we are also urging them, mm -hmm. the international journalists, mm -hmm. uh, not only send sports uh, journalists there, send some investigative journalists, uh, because they are opening up. I mean, Chinese are opening up for the first time. Mm -hmm. Ask them to send to North Korean border to see how the North Korean refugees have been treated. Do you think, uh, Kumar, that uh, I may overstate this, but this is television, so we must be mm -hmm. a little emphatic, that this is almost a once-in-a-lifetime opportunity? In other words, what you said, said moments ago, China asked to be scrutinized. And we have the eyes of the world and the Olympics. So in other words, this is the chance for Amnesty International, the world community, the international press to really put forth their best effort to get compliance. Yeah, I mean, they, they are the ones who link. Chinese are the ones who linked human rights to Olympics, mm -hmm. which we would love it, but before even we do, did it, they did it. Right. And International Olympics Committee basically endorsed it. Mm -hmm. Now both of them, Chinese government and International Olympics Committee are silent on the human rights issues happening inside today, even today. Mm -hmm. I mean, leave alone what happened a couple of years ago. 
So this is a great opportunity because, because there are tens of thousands of people who are going to go there. Right. And the spotlight is going to be there. Right. So it's important that, uh, that, uh, that China's human rights being scrutinized. Amnesty International is not singling out China, by the way. When uh, US had its Olympics in Atlanta a couple of years ago, we had a major campaign, worldwide campaign, about the death penalty in, in the US. That. And our Secretary General flew into Atlanta and made a big deal out of it. So it's not like singling out. This is about putting the pressure to make sure China treats its own people. We are not talking about anything. Mm -hmm. Treats its own people in a way that, uh, that every human being wanted to be treated. That's a good point to make. And I remember the, uh, the issues that Amnesty International brought up in the 96 uh, uh, Olympics in mm -hmm. Atlanta. This, the answer to this question may be self-evident, but, but I think it might be important just to bring it out, and that is that the rationale. Why does the Chinese government do this kind of thing? You know, why do they repress human rights in the first place? It's a, they're obviously brilliant, sophisticated people. And, uh, it, well, it's, it strikes me they must fear, and I'm, I'm thinking now of the repression of uh, intellectual rights, of the Internet and other things being so tightly controlled. Mm -hmm. um, there must be a fear of disorder, of disharmony, of challenges to the state that must be driving a lot of this. Is that your perception? Not really. Uh -huh. uh, the real uh -huh. issue is uh, there is it's one party country. Ah, right. You know, yeah. whatever whatever term you use it, it could be communism, it could be, but it's one party state. Mm -hmm. They're extremely fearful of losing that control. So to maintain control, they're exercising brutality against its own people no independence of judiciary, no media. Definitely they don't want media, mm -hmm. into, including internet. And uh, there is another element for abuses is uh, non-Chinese people in Tibet and Xinjiang. Mm -hmm. they've, they, they are kind of, you know, they, they want to control them. They want to keep them under their fold. So the only way to control them is to brutalize them and submit, submit them. That, that's why Dalai Lama, His Holiness Dalai Lama, fled in 58 mm -hmm. to India. And he's still in exile. Right. Because of what you have just said, because it's a one-party state, would that account, and this is another uh, of the major complaints that the Amnesty Report makes, uh, is that the reason why the government is particularly uh, concerned with and, and repressive towards the democracy movement, the Tiananmen Square group, the 1989-inspired mm -hmm. group? That must, I would think that would have to be. Yeah, yeah, because they, the only thing that they worry is uh, their control of the, of the country. Mm -hmm. They may have excuses that it, when they lose control, the whole country is going to collapse. Uh, that's the excuse for them to be in power. Right. That's not the reality. I mean, we have seen countries around the world. I mean, when things change, uh, things change for positive things. Like even Pakistan, look at elections. Yeah. Just took place, we are seeing some positive movements now. Yeah, but I guess they don't want to take that chance. They don't want to take the chance because they want to control it. Yeah. Uh, by the way, they have moved away from the so-called communist philosophy of, uh, of, of you know, equality and everything. Now they have the corporations pumping in money. Well, now here's, now that, <laughs> well, that, I'm glad you raised that point because it was one of the things that it's been in the back of my mind. Let me ask that now. The corporations are pumping in money. Mm -hmm. The China that you and I are discussing today is not the one we grew up knowing. There's no question about mm -hmm. that. And it's, re and uh, the, I mean, there are many, many Chinese billionaires now, or at least a growing number. And, and there's a lot of wealth. There's a, a growing and sophisticated upper middle class. I want to ask you about that group, the group that has civil, not civil power so much, but influence because- Economic power. Economic power. Um, I'm wondering, let me pose it colorfully, have they, that group, made a kind of a Faustian bargain, that's like, you know, Faust selling his soul to the devil, to sort of go along with this government system because it, it'll preserve some of their, you know, their, their clout. Yeah, they love it. I would think, yeah, well, that's yeah, the answer. Yeah, they're, plus, they're, no? they're uh. some, some of them, if not many of them, are, are members of the Communist Party now. Mm -hmm. I mean, I don't know how that fits in with the Communist <laughs> right, Party philosophy yeah, with, uh, with, with multi-billion dollars people sitting there. Mm -hmm. uh, number two, uh, this system helped them. Yeah. This current system is helping them. Yeah. So they are pretty okay. By the way, they are buying off, off the law there. For example, I mean, death penalty is one, mm -hmm. but one key example is Chinese have the one-child policy right. because they want to control the population. 
and if you if you be, if you have a second child, they'll be fined. And these rich people Pay are paying fine. off. They are just paying off right. and having two, three children now. Yeah. So it's actually affecting the whole justice issue, ru leave the rule of law issue, just common fairness issue. Mm -hmm. If you are poor, you only are stuck with one child. Right. If you are rich, then you can have more than one child. Mm. You know, this is interesting because I have yet to get to China, but I have been in other places where, and I have I've, I've witnessed development and repression that mm. coexist. And it did strike me that the people who had the education also had, often had the money and were not going to speak out because they were getting privileges and, and uh, benefits mm -hmm. from things as they were. Keeping the lid on, so to speak, was important mm -hmm. to them. Very interesting. Well, the amnesty report, Kumar, concludes as reports uh, generally do with a list of recommended actions mm -hmm. to the Chinese. They run quite the gamut from the release of prisoners, such as we yeah. discussed earlier, the uh, prisoners of conscience, to uh, major issues of domestic uh, media freedom uh, and points in between. That, of course, has been presented to the Chinese government? Yes, we have presented. But before I move into that, mm -hmm. uh, on the re-education through labor camp, mm -hmm. where people can be detained without charge or trial by the local police and or party officials, there are 250,000 people, people under that system. In that category? Yeah, that means a quarter of a million have been locked up under that category. So it's extremely disturbing, extremely disturbing. Let's, re let's, let's review this for a moment. These are the people who are under that four-year yeah. imprisonment category yeah. without charges being without brought? Without charge. Do they have access to legal counsel? Well, no, how, no. Do, well how did you find out this? Oh, we have, that's our research. You know, we have researchers and mm -hmm. uh, we have done extensive research. What does the government say when it's presented with a figure like that? I mean, there is internal movement mm -hmm. to change that. But now Chinese are using this particular system to lock up people mm -hmm. who are raising concerns about Olympics and demolition of buildings. You know, people are angry because, because to build uh, the Olympic stadiums and other places, there are a lot of demolition going on. Well, that raises another question. Has, we we're talking now about the Olympics being a focus for the world on China, but is China, for its part, using the run-up to the Olympics as a way of cracking down even harder, getting you know, these things done just to keep the streets clean? So yeah, they have kicked people out, uh, and also they have um, put a lot of activists under house arrest. And using this re-education through labor system mm -hmm. to lock people up, uh, it's not improving. Human rights right. issues are not improving at all. Mm -hmm. By the way, before I forget, uh, President Bush is planning to go to China. He accepted the invitation without any qualms, immediately, jolly well knowing mm -hmm. the situation, what's happening in China. Mm -hmm. And a couple of weeks ago, when journalists asked him, whether are you going to go? He said, yes, 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 it's a sports event. I'm going to enjoy the sports, but, uh, but it's extremely disturbing. Mm -hmm. The president of a country did not even care to the people of country which, with whom he is going to visit and not even think of raising it. Mm -hmm. That's the, another disturbing element of, of the whole Olympic saga that's going on now. Well, let's talk about the whole Olympic saga in that regard, because I know at the same time you released the report on China, there was a separate letter to the International Olympic Committee, yeah. is there not, asking them it was it Peter Rogue who? Yeah, the chairman. Chairman yeah. who runs that. And uh, so, what are they? They, they, they are one of the silent partners now. They are one of the. They claim. But that did they say that they would at least try to to, uh, to press on some of these topics? No, or? they didn't. Initially, they said they will be looking out mm -hmm. to for improvements. They said security, environment, mm -hmm. and human rights. These three areas are fundamental for Olympic Committee, and they'll be watching this. Mm -hmm. They have only taken steps on security and environment, mm. and they have closed their eyes uh, when it comes to human rights. Mm. I mean, for them, human rights is, uh, is in, kind of they can get away with that. Mm -hmm. Only these two, they, they need it. Yeah. Our question is, International Olympics Committee, number one, they gave us the word to the international human rights movement and the world at large that they will hold China accountable for meaningful improvements. But will they go to China if the security is bad? No, they are not going to go. If the environment is bad, they are not going to go. But they are ready to go when the human rights is bad. That's the disturbing point. Mm. 
They know because we have given them enormous report. Right. They are well versed about what's happening. So I think your, your major point is there's a lot of hypocrisy about priorities. It's money, money plays, you know, there are even U.S. corporations are behind it. I mean, not in right. abuses. Well, when, when we speak of money and prestige, or maybe it, it might cut two ways. For example, let me ask you this, because it's, it's the other side of the same question. When someone like Steven Spielberg, mm -hmm. who is an artistic powerhouse and uh, one of the most influential people in the world, says that no, he's not going to be a part of the Beijing mm. design uh, thing that he was heading, what kind of effect does that have? It had some effect, but he he only linked his decision to the situation in Darfur. Darfur. Mm -hmm. He should have actually at least mentioned something mm -hmm. in China, mm -hmm. what's happening. You know, that would have been given a bigger picture mm -hmm. of uh, Chinese can, can, it's about Chinese foreign policy he was concerned, right. not about their treatment of their own people. Right. So we hope Spielberg and others will will also speak out. They should speak out about uh, Darfur and Burma and North Korea situation, mm -hmm. where Chinese foreign policy is involved. Mm -hmm. But they should also look deeper and to say, wait a minute, mm -hmm. we are only talking about their foreign policy. What about their treatment of their own the people? Internal, internal oh, it's people. horrible. What's happening is shocking. Right. Because it's shocking, and um, um, as we come to the end of our conversation, you give me even just a brief sentence on this, it'd be very, very helpful. Because it is shocking and because it is China and because it is a successful economic model, is it all the more important that the human rights campaign succeed? I mean, as a model, it, it can convince other countries you can develop, get rich, and ignore human rights unless it's... That's true. Uh -huh. Vietnam is copying that model. Right. And other countries are looking up to China, at least in Asia, right, so for this model of open up uh, economically and mm -hmm. crack down on political freedom. That makes it all the more important. I want to thank you so much for bringing this to our attention, as you always do. Thank you Pleasure very to have much. You. Pleasure. Mine. Thank you. And that's our program. We appreciate your comments, and you can reach us at dialogue at wilsoncenter.org. I'm George Liston, CA, and you've been watching Dialogue, a co-production of the Woodrow Wilson International Center for Scholars and MHC Networks. Dialogue is also on the MHC Worldview Channel, which is available to public TV stations nationwide. For more information, go to www.mhcworldview.org. Please join us again right here next week, and thank you for watching this week. Kumar, thank, thank you, you very much. That was really yeah, great. Yeah, thanks. thanks for interviewing me. The Art of Conversation, Dialogue at the Woodrow Wilson Center, features 20 years of dialogue. Distributed by the John Hopkins University Press, www.press.jhu.edu.